Say hello, everyone, and welcome to FRAP Council webinar, What You Need to Know About Copyright and Social Media. My name is Claudia Tapia, President of FRAP Council, and I will be your host today. As you may already know, FRAP Council is a non-profit research council developing high-quality academic insight and empirical evidence on topic related to intellectual property, that is IP, and innovation. The EU IPR help desk, who helped us to promote this webinar, is a service funded by the European Commission, provided free of charge, first line, ad first line advice and information on IP. On Frepi Council's website, we have created an SME corner that provides relevant information to those who aim to have a better understanding of IP. I would like to encourage those of you who have still not done so to click in Stay Informed on the right side of the page to be able to receive our newsletters and invites for future webinars. On FRAPI Council website, you will also be able to find information about the different kinds of IP, what they protect, how long the protection is for, and what steps are required. You can also learn about how to use your IP to grow your business. Our aim is to explain the strategic value of IP and help you capture it. You will hear more on this on today's webinar. And we will upload the webinar and the slides free of charge following the presentation. Now, please allow me to introduce you to our great speaker, Dr. Haley Boscher. She's an internationally published legal academic, speaker, and legal consultant specializing in IP, media, and entertainment law. Haley is a lecturer in IP law in Brunel University, London, visiting research fellow at the Center for IP, Policy and Management, blocker for IPCAT, deputy director of the European Trademark Reports, and founder of the World IP Women Network. And she holds a PhD in copyright law from Bournemouth University. So with this impressive CV, uh, I'm very delighted to have you as a speaker today. And without further delay, Haley, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to give this webinar today because I just really love talking about social media and copyright. Um, there is so much we could talk about, but in the time that we've got, I hope to cover these five uh, main kind of topics, areas of discussion that come up when I'm usually talking about social media and copyright. There's sort of the um, most popular questions that I get, that kind of thing, through both teaching and conference and through clients as well. So I really hope that this um, webinar is useful to you. And of course, we've got time for Q&A at the end. So if there's anything you want me to expand on um, or something that I didn't touch on that you're interested to hear more about, please do uh, stay to the end and ask questions. We'll have plenty of time. So. The first thing I want to talk about is uh, the remit of social media, which is quite a funny thing to be discussing with social media being such a new, new phenomenon, yet has changed so much in such a short time. So uh, we can think of social media as uh, in a, <laughs> it's funny to say traditional, but in the traditional sense of uh, being a, a platform where there is user generated uh, content it's something that uh, obviously is online and therefore has a global reach. Um, and it started um, as something that we could consider just sharing of information, um, files, music, photographs um, and videos, but has now expanded 
uh, to have the, so the remit of what social media, the capacity of social media, what it is and how users interact with it has grown. And with that growth has uh, obviously been of real benefit to the uh, platforms themselves. I really just want to highlight at this point that the social media social media as a is a lucrative business. Um, and I think it's important to remember that later on when I start talking about how I think there should maybe be a little bit more responsibility for platforms, I totally understand that there are challenges there for the platforms. Um, but if we bear in mind these kind of figures that you can see on the screen, uh, I think that kind of helps us to balance when we're considering whether the platforms should uh, be involved in mitigating, for example, the risks uh, for copyright holders and users uh, for infringement. Um, so it's a, it's a hugely lucrative business and it's um, growing. So I've got this slide here that shows you in 2017 and 2018, the huge amount of people who are uh, both on the internet and then on social media um, and that's grown even since then um, I think on the next slide yeah so 45% of the world's population is now on social media which is crazy when you consider that only about 50% of the it says on the, on this side if we just go back 55.1% of the world's population has internet access and then 45%. So basically almost everybody online is also using social media. But as I said, the remit of social media is also um, expanding. So we could, you can consider the concept of social media in a narrower sense of say just Instagram or Twitter, but then also um, you might even consider like YouTube, there's LinkedIn, there's TikTok, there's actually a broader kind of understanding of what social media is. Um, for this presentation in particular, I'm really talking more generally um, about any social media platform, particularly in relation to uh, images and videos, because those are um, the ones that become the contentious copyright issues. But really, I'm just touching on these, these things because obviously with the different platforms and different um, uses that those platforms offer to their users, um, there are much broader issues to do with privacy and all sorts of other things that would that are not covered in, in this uh, particular webinar. Um, so one of the things that um, is, a, is a particular growing concern for copyright holders is counterfeit goods. And um, with the functionality abilities of social media broadening with um, to include now social shopping. So as I mentioned before, traditionally we might think of social media as just sharing information, videos and uh, photos, for example. Now we are seeing streaming through social media. That's become a huge problem for copyright holders, say, in the sports industry. Um, we've got temporary images through stories, um, which actually have, at first we were like, is this something that could be a copyright issue when the video expires within 24 hours uh, on some uh, platforms? But actually, it has been, there was a case with Victoria Beckham who posted on her story uh, and that, that story because other people can screen cap and save the story. So even though it's only 24 hours on her profile, it's actually, um, it's archived anyway on her profile, but it's not necessarily temporary because other people can, can save from, from that temporary story. So that's another issue. But going back to uh, online shopping, so with the rise of the influencer, we've had um, much more sort of growth in the area of social media shopping where the user stays within the platform to uh, make purchases. And one of the biggest concerns in terms of copyright is um, counterfeit goods being sold through uh, social media. There was a, a report done by the UK IPO back in 2017, where they looked at this growing concern of counterfeit uh, goods on social media. And they, what, they, what they found was that um, there is many ways in which somebody can um, market counterfeit goods through social media. There's fan pages, they clone whole websites. 
uh, using fake profiles, um, all this kind of thing. And they, they, you can see the quote there, they called it a haven for counterfeiters. So that really, that really is a huge concern. And I've spoken to some huge companies that say they have uh, problems with, especially on platforms like Facebook, where the profile, the the counterfeit profile is almost exactly the same, like they couldn't even tell the difference themselves um, between their legitimate um, profile and the, and the counterfeit good one. So the technology there does enable um, higher risk of uh, counterfeit goods. So um, at the end of each section, I've got, so as I mentioned, the five sections, I'm trying to briefly give you an overview and then draw together maybe some tips or things to take home kind of messages um, in regards to that particular topic. And I've called it the social media strategy. Um, and this is the kind of things that maybe I would be advising my clients or um, it's, it's, diff it's so difficult. I mean, as I'm sure some of you have, if, and we've got some people signed up who maybe are lawyers and they probably feel the same, you know, so difficult to advise a client on um, their social media strategy because they want to share so much and then you think, okay, but there's risks with that. And also everything's changing almost daily. So um, it is, it really is hard and it is really about uh, mitigating risk. It's a risk assessment game. So I think the first thing is always awareness. So just be aware that, you know, there are counterfeit issues on social media platforms and you need to implement that in your uh, IP enforcement strategy that includes, um, you know, you can sign up with um, certain software that will scan and, and pick up potential counterfeiters or you can do it manually, just keeping an eye, uh, searching, but that, that needs to be part of your game plan. Be vigilant in checking is what I've said there because it's the, obviously the responsibility of the copyright holder to ensure that that's there. Uh, and also, I think there is, as I mentioned, about the um, responsibility of the platforms, they do have a responsibility to um, help kind of protect users because maybe they don't know they're buying counterfeit goods and protect copyright holders uh, in their um, not allowing infringing copies or, inf or uh, counterfeit goods available on their platforms. So, all social media platforms, to my knowledge, have some form of uh, notice and takedown, notice and stay down, or claim that you can put through. So some of them are more straightforward than others. You're probably familiar with the YouTube one. Um, Instagram, you have to make a claim, and they, I have seen them do it. They do take things down, but they, they say things like, we've removed this content because it's in breach of our terms and conditions, rather than because we agree there's a a copyright or counterfeit good issue. Uh, so that's that's something that could be improved. Uh, the third thing I would say in terms of strategy is communicate with your um, customers. So there are different ways you can do this, like with the blue tick, for example, on Twitter, you can use the platform to help you signify, but also communicating through, for example, a story uh, where to help your um, customers know this is a legitimate option, this is not a legitimate option. I mean, that might be a bit of a, a pipe dream, but as I said, it's really difficult to manage the situation with your clients and you want to um, just do the, the best that you can um, with, and as well as putting pressure on the platforms to try and help with the situation as well. So moving on to our second topic, copyright works on social media. So uh, as you probably know, copyright is a type of intellectual property right that protects things such as uh, photographs and uh, videos. I'm just highlighting these particular two types of things that copyright protects because those are the most prominent things on social media. But obviously there, there are other things. Um, and it lasts 70 years after the death of the creator, so it's there for a long time. And once uh, somebody has copyright in their photograph, for example, the idea is that copyright gives them the exclusive right to copy, publish, or communicate that photograph to the public. Copyright is a territorial right, which means that it's slightly different in different countries. We do have um, international agreements such as the Berne Convention and the Trips Agreement. So there are minimum standards across all the countries that are signatory to these international agreements. So you'll find that most countries do have 70 years after the death of the creators. You don't, 
but there are some variations, um, for example, in the copyright exceptions, which uh, I'll mention a little bit later. But that makes things a challenge because obviously, the internet, as I mentioned, the internet and social media is a global phenomenon and copyright is a territorial right. So that can create uh, tensions and um, challenges, especially if you're a copyright holder and you're trying to enforce um, your your rights globally. I would say in, in that um, respect that a lot of the time the platform runs under US law, usually California, because that's the, the base where the social media company is. Um, so that does give some level of certainty there in terms of making a, a, a claim. So as I mentioned, copyright, the purpose of copyright is in it, it's essential, even though sometimes it's seen as a barrier and maybe a, sometimes a difficult, challenging thing, it's actually there. It's supposed to uh, encourage creativity and dissemination of culture, knowledge and information. And it does this by, uh, as I mentioned, trying to um, give the copyright holder the exclusive right to uh, copy and share their work. And that in enables them to say license or sell their work. Um, I've just given you here on if you're looking at the slides, the Copyright Designs and Patents Act that says CDPA. That's only uh, if you're, that would be the UK law. But as I said, there will be um, local equivalents wherever you are. So as you can probably imagine, copyright is trying to restrict sharing and say only the copyright holder can share the photograph but then we go to the land of social media and there are 95 million photos and videos shared on Instagram every single day. 40 billion photos and videos have been shared uh, since Instagram uh, was created. So we've got a clash of philosophies here where uh, copyright is trying to restrict sharing and social media is trying to encourage sharing. This links back to the point about how much money the platforms make. So most of their revenue comes from advertising. That means they want people to spend as much time as possible on the platform, sharing as much as possible, engaging with each other as much as possible, which can have many, many benefits. Uh, but one of the negatives of that is that um, a lot of the time we share third party content um, without permission. One of the questions that I've been thinking about and, and in my research looking at is whether we should reconsider the kind of threshold for copyright in relation to this level of content online, because in order for a work to be protected by copyright, it must be original. But our legal definition of originality is author's own intellectual creation. And that's actually a relatively low threshold, because as long as you um, express an idea in a way that is um, unique to you, then in theory your, your photo or, or video would be protected by copyright. Um, we've seen in some of the case law some uh, judges referring to things like the creator's ability to exercise free and creative choices. So when we think about this in relation to social media, we do know that the platform offers or in a way limits some of the choices of the um, of the copyright hold of sorry of the creator so if you think about Instagram for example all the images have to be in square shape in order to be posted on on there and you have the different filters which are they're set for you so it's not that um, it's not a choice made by the creator in in although they can choose different uh, like lighting and stuff. So like I said, it's just something I've been, I'm thinking about. Um, and I think that because there is so much content posted on social media daily, does this in a way make um, the originality of copyright, what would be copyright protected uh, material, maybe it is less original. Also coupled with the fact that we now have more technologically enabled creativity, uh, and everybody has a has a figuratively speaking like lots of people have um, say a handset that or a phone um, that enables them everybody can be a photographer so if you think about a popular photo say of the Eiffel Tower where like thousands of people go every day and take the very same photo 
according to copyright, everybody can do that, and and that's their own expression of that um, idea. They've used their own. Is that would that be copyright protectable? And should it should it be? Is the question. I've put a case there where um, I'll actually talk about the case a little bit later as well. Um, but in that particular case, the the photograph was um, a very popular image, a bit like I was saying of the Eiffel Tower, but it was a bridge. Um, and the, the question of whether the photograph qualified for copyright in, was never raised in the case. It was just assumed of oh, this photograph has copyright and it's been infringed. Um, and that's a really good example of, like, well, maybe, some, maybe given um, the context of the technologically enabled creativity, the levels of content that we're dealing with and the limitations put on by the social media platforms, like whether all these photos uh, should be protected by uh, copyright. So in relation to your uh, strategy or your take home points uh, in, on this uh, section, at present, they we would probably consider that most photographs and videos on social media are likely to be copyright protected. They probably do meet the um, threshold, the original ones. Um, so when you're thinking about what to um, one, the, sorry, I'm just thinking about the middle one. So sometimes I get clients ask me, like, I don't know what to do with my social media profile because I want to share things, and uh, but I want to stop those things being shared again uh, without my permission. And I think sometimes you've got to take a realistic view and just think, okay, well, if I put it on social media, it probably is going to be shared. So sometimes a better strategy is not to say, um, don't use social media because I have seen this as advice before where people have said you know just just don't you don't use social media don't post on social media i think that's an unrealistic view especially in the market say for example if your client is a fashion designer or an artist or a photographer then in a way so social media has become a kind of portfolio and so um, it's not uh, practical to say to them just don't use social media but one thing you can do is be selective with what you share Sometimes I say with the fashion client to share like elements of the process, but not the final product or pick parts of your line that you're happy to share, but not don't give everything away. So I think, again, it's just that having that common sense approach of, well, you know, things will be shared rightly or wrongly. Um, and at this point, let's just be vigilant. Let's just be careful about what we share and what we don't share. Uh, and in terms of sharing, my next topic is about infringement so sharing other people's content which i will look at now so copyright infringement on social media as i mentioned the the kind of ethos of social media platforms is to everybody share everybody spend a lot of time share your own content and share other people's content um but what we don't realize a lot of users is that when they are um sharing third party content, technically that's going to be an infringement of copyright because copyright infringement is taking the whole or substantial part of somebody else's work without permission or a license or a copyright exception. So if you are in general, say you're on social media, you take a screen cap of a photograph that you like and you reshare it, technically uh, that's going to be an infringement of the rights holder. But it's something that has become really normal and every day and everybody's doing it. The problem is that the risks for the user is on the rise. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some cases that have been in the media, but they and they they relate to famous people. So we think, OK, well, the risk for for them is maybe different because they're high profile, they're more likely to be sued. Um, since the uh, copyright holder might see that as a more profitable thing to do. But honestly, I have seen, have seen just, you know, regular uh, social media users being sued and contacted um, for copyright infringement. And they, it's really difficult uh, to say to them, like, well, actually, they're right, you have infringed, but you know, it's a big shock to them, they're very surprised about this. Um, and there are um, a growing number of services for copyright holders, especially uh, photographers. You can upload your photograph to a website um, and they will use a bit like the YouTube content ID. So they use that photo to scan the internet and scan social media. And then when they find a match, they automatically send a claim letter. Um, one example I saw where, again, it was a very generic um, 
it was a harbor, a photograph of a harbor, and the claim was for five thousand euros. So um, it just seems a bit like maybe an unfair playing field because a lot of the time this is happening and the users are completely unaware of what is copyright, and I didn't understand this was illegal because you know everybody's doing it on social media. So again, I think this leads us to asking whether the the platform should take more responsibility um to you know better educate their users and inform the users you it is in the terms and conditions we'll get to that in a minute but um you know we we know that the users don't read the terms and conditions so we can't we can't say oh they put it in the terms and conditions and therefore that's their part done i actually think that since they generate most of their income from advertising and encouraging people to share that actually um and, and YouTube do do it. If you uh, infringe copyright on YouTube, they will send you to copyright school where you essentially like, watch a video about copyright. And I think that is a great example of um, helping the users to understand rather than just saying, oh, you, here's an infringement claim. Um, and so maybe that's something that also should be on um, say Instagram, for example. So let me just tell you briefly about these uh, cases. You might have heard of the uh, Chloe Kardashian case. Uh, it's particularly well known in the media because it was one of the first, um, and it was one of the first kind of celebrity cases and it involved a picture of herself, which from a media perspective was a bit confusing because they saw that as, I don't understand, you know, I don't understand why I can't post, why she can't post a picture of herself on her own social media account. But copyright resides in the, with the photographer, not the person being photographed. So the photographer is the copyright holder and he had licensed his photo. Um, and then uh, Chloe Kardashian removes the watermark, which was very naughty, and then <laughs> Uh, post the picture of herself on her social media. She sued for copyright infringement um, and the case actually settled out of court, which uh, is not surprising because as I said, the same when the clients come and say, I've received this letter, you're like, yeah, well, it is copyright infringement. You don't really have a leg to stand on. Um, so there's been loads of similar cases. Um, I mentioned the Gigi Hadid one because that's uh, one of my favorites actually, um, because she was sued once for uh, in exactly the same, almost exactly the same circumstances as the Kardashian case and it, and it settled out of court. And then she was sued again uh, for the same thing. And this time she decided <laughs> I'm gonna put up a fight. And she put forward some really interesting arguments. Um, I'm not really sure if any of them actually had legs, but it was really interesting to read her side of the story saying maybe it was fair use, maybe she should have a joint ownership in the photograph because she smiled and posed and therefore she gave some kind of um, value to the image and all this stuff it was really, really interesting. Um, sadly, this case never, also never came, uh, they didn't settle, but there was an issue with the registration of copyright because it was a US case and you have to register your copyright before you can um, pursue the claim and they actually hadn't done that. So the whole thing fell apart basically because of an admin error. Um, but I'm sure we will see many, many more of these cases. I mean, from my perspective, I think that um, when it comes to the celebrity cases, I suppose that the celebrity, especially say like the Kardashians and people who are in the industry and maybe have already a better understanding of what is copyright because that's partly part of their business strategy as well. Uh, maybe they, they, it's less hard to sympathize with them is what I'm trying to say. But when it's a case of the individual user, um, I think that that shows a little bit of unfairness there. This is the photograph I was telling you about just a minute ago, um, the, the bridge photograph where it was a copyright infringement came, claim. So it's not, uh, this case is not on social media, it was just on a web page, but it illustrates many of the same points that we've been uh, discussing. So um, a student actually posted, uh, sorry, a student used this photograph in their uh, assignment. The school thought this is a great <laughs> assignment and posted it on their school website. The photograph um, was then it, the subject of a claim from the photographer and ultimately uh, it was decided it was um, 
an infringement. So even though it's on a website, not on social media, the principle is uh, the same. And that leads us into the, uh, that's uh, the, the final thing we're going to talk about today in, in the education um, topic. So I'll come back to that case. So uh, I did mention that it's only a copyright infringement if you uh, use the work, use the photograph or the whatever it is, the copyright work without permission or a license or the benefit of a copyright exception. So um, these are the UK exceptions that you can see on the screen now. But as I mentioned, copyright is different in different countries. And some, for example, you can see private copying is got a line for it because we had it for a very short time and then there was a judicial review and it, it was removed again. So, uh, but in some countries there is a private copying exception. Um, in terms of do these, any of these apply on social media? Um, I mean, it would be maybe parody. <laughs> I'm like maybe parody. So they, all the exceptions that we have, especially in the UK are, I would say narrow and specific. So they are useful if you are doing exactly the thing that it's providing for. Uh, for example, say news reporting. If you're reporting the news, you don't need to copyright clearance, but that does not apply to photographs. So that sort of is not um, available, for example, if you're talking about posting an image. Um, for educational use, again, that's gonna be within the walls of the institution. So that's not gonna apply on social media. Parody, probably. Um, Although obviously we have no definition of parody, we haven't any cases over here yet about that. Quotation criticism and review, maybe, if you really are using the third party content for the purpose of criticism and review. So um, if you, that, that means that like posting it and then being like, I'm critiquing it, it was good, <laughs> is not something that's gonna wash. This H1 comes with its, its own criteria and its own um, specifics about what you need to do in order to uh, benefit from that. Just to say Orphan Works is on that list. It's not really an exception at all because um, we, well, in the UK, we have an Orphan Works licensing scheme. So if you don't know who the copyright holder is and you've done a diligent search, then you can pay a license fee to the UK IPO who will hold it if and when uh, the copyright holder appears, then, then that, that works. Um, and you pro will probably find that with the rise of social media and so many photos, the as does the orphan works, um, number of orphan works, because of the way that things are shared. You know, on, if you think about any social media sort of meme or quote that's miss, apparently Gandhi said this, but really it was Marianne Williamson or whatever. So uh, that that's probably something that's going to become a bigger issue. So I'm just looking at the clock, trying to stay focused on time. Social media strategy when we're talking about um, copyright infringement. Be aware that sharing other people's content on social media without permission is likely to be copyright infringement and the risk of doing so is on the rise. Not only are we having a lot more uh, cases, particularly in the US, between a, a photographer or photo agency and a celebrity, I'm also seeing on the ground a lot of claims made against, I don't want to speak ordinary, but not famous, <laughs> um, social media users. We don't see any cases around this because a lot of the time it's just settled or negotiated because ultimately it is an infringement and it's very hard to argue that it's not. Um, what is that? Sharing uh, within social media. Okay, so I just wanted to say that in case everyone's like freaking out, but there are some, some sharing on social media that's less risky. For example, if you share using the share button, say for example on Facebook, is less risky because it shares um, as kind of a hyperlink rather than, for example, if you screen cap and post it again, then um, that's a higher risk. Also, some people think that if I just quote the name of the person who posted it originally or uh, the creator, that gets you off the hook for infringement and sadly it doesn't. I mean, that does mean that you're respecting their moral rights. Um, and it, you know, it does help because the copyright exceptions require you to, um, where possible, acknowledge the original creator, but it doesn't stop it being an infringement. Exceptions may apply, and so it's a good idea to look into those depending on what you're doing to see if you could benefit. But as I said, they're very, specific and narrow. Okay, so now we're on to the terms and conditions. 
<laughs> I love talking about this. And to be honest, every single time I do, the terms and conditions have changed. So this is a quote of the, um, the founder of Instagram saying, Instagram users own their own content uh, and the Instagram doesn't claim any ownership uh, in the photos that are posted by its users. But if you go and look at the uh, Instagram terms and conditions, I put the link there and anyway, you can just Google it. Um, they do, it does, it does change often. <laughs> Every time I look at it, I swear it's different, but uh, this part always seems to stay the same. The user grants uh, Instagram, and this is also, a, I'm using this as a case study, but it applies across all the platforms. Um, at, <laughs> you grant us and our affiliates, who they don't name, so it could be anyone, a non-exclusive, transferable, sub-licensable, royalty treat free worldwide license to use any data, content and other information made available by you or on your behalf in connection with your use of the platform. I mean, that is just amazing to me that anybody has the audacity to write that as their terms. But I mean, just fascinating stuff. So not only do you grant Instagram, any of their affiliates, we don't know who they are, a non-exclusive license that's transferable, they can give it to anyone, side licensable, royalty free, world across the world. And any data content or other information made available you on or on your behalf. So does that mean if you, somebody else uploads my content without my permission, it's made available on my behalf and therefore they can use it again without my permission? I mean, it's just amazing. Here's a little uh, breakdown of what that means in terms of what Instagram can do with your, um, with your content. Um, this also applies, obviously, to the, to the data, which is a big concern if you're looking at it from a privacy uh, pers perspective. But just from a copyright perspective, this is what it means. Um, so creators beware. I think the main thing on a practical level is just to know that when you upload something to Instagram, you are licensing it to them and it's a very broad license and it's worldwide. So if you're advising a client, for example, or if you're a copyright holder, then just bear that in mind. It's a non-exclusive license, but then it means you could never exclusively license that work whilst it's up on the platform. As far as I know, again, it changes, uh, but the last time I checked, the it's it, it's gone back and forth from this, but most um, recently I've checked and the Instagram terms and conditions say, even if you delete your account, the terms succeed. I have at one point it changed to, if you don't like our terms and conditions, you can delete your account at any time, which was just brilliant and a bit sassy. Uh, but now uh, I believe, or at least the last time I checked that it, it survives. So, and I think that's partly because um, some of the uses of the images are unretrievable by Instagram. So for example, if they were, say, selling um, bundles of photographs of people to AI software developing companies to train the AI software, they couldn't retrieve that, that back if you deleted your account. And therefore, they have to make the license survive in order to do that. The problem is then that even if you delete your account, you still don't know when or how they've used that uh, image and you've lost, you've lost your control over it. So um, they don't own the content. They say they don't own their content. And I think that they're not really very open with their uh, users because, OK, they don't own it, but they have a lot of the rights that a rights holder would have. Uh, and we also know that in general, users don't um, read the terms and conditions. As I mentioned earlier, the terms and conditions do ask you to uh, warrant that you have not uploaded any infringing content. So that protects the, um, the platform if there is a problem. Um, and again, it's not likely that the users will read or understand this. And it's very contradictory because the platform is saying you warrant that everything you upload, you've either got a license for or it's yours, but then you go on the platform and it's all about sharing. Uh, so that's really confusing. This is just to say that you also um, are not allowed to share anything beyond uh, about from from the platform. So it's, it's definitely a one way street, shall we say. Um, there has been some cases. So you may have heard that the Paris um, Court of First Instance, they found that Twitter's terms were abusive and they had to uh, pay a relatively small 30,000 euros. But you've seen how much money they're making. That's really a um, small amount in comparison to um, what they're, and they did have to report the case on social, on their 
um, social media. In France, though, remember, it's territorial, so the Paris Court only has jurisdiction over Twitter's terms in France, and, and they changed them in France. Um, there was also a case um, about Facebook, where the same court actually, they, they found that 430 of the Facebook clauses were abusive and unlawful. In particular, they uh, found the transfer of copyright to be dis disproportionate um, and also as an unclear and confusing. So I do think that um, it's time for the platforms to, I, I mean, they're obviously aware of this because as I said, I, every time I go on there, they're a little bit different, but they really need to be explained to the user in a way that the user understands. They need to be better communicating with the user in terms of um, what is copyright infringement and that they are at risk, the users are at risk. And that can be dealt with so easily with something like copyright school or, or notification system. Um, I, I think that it, it definitely is something that the platforms can address uh, more so than they have been doing. So I'm very conscious of time and we're just on to the fifth topic, um, copyright, uh, social media in education. So um, as mentioned, I'm a lecturer at um, Brunel University London. I teach IP to undergraduate and postgraduate students and uh, in my own I actually teach as part of some of my courses about social media so I use social media in my teaching but I realized recently um, uh, that I've been running some courses for other lecturers in other universities that social media is becoming a tool for education so it's a really good way to connect with the students uh, communicating sort of on a on a platform that they understand and they know how to use uh, and in a way that they enjoy and um, it can even be used as a form of assessment uh, discussion i've used it for example when i've been teaching a social media module i get students to engage with any social media platform that they want to have a kind of client um lawyer like communication over over the platform and that means doing things like giving advice with a with a video or, or whatever so for them they really enjoy it and it's relevant um and it's a, we have facebook groups and all that stuff but with that amazing opportunity and good positive things comes the risk of um obviously copyright infringement i don't have time to show you this video but if you are interested to learn more about um teacher and student perspectives on copyright user, we created some videos actually of, of all different types of creators and we interviewed um, some teachers and we found that they're either one way or the other. So they're either risk averse and they're frightened to put anything up, even on their slides within the classroom um, that might be copyright infringement or they're like, oh, it's fine. I just put my lecture slides on on YouTube and it's no problem. Uh, but actually, there's a lot of uncertainty around how um, lecturers can or can't use uh, copyright material from in the UK as I mentioned we have the um, copyright exceptions for education but again they're very narrow uh, and they're really for the purpose of illustration within the institution so I kind of explain it in very simple terms that it has to be like within the walls of the classroom so as soon as you go on social media you're outside the walls of the classroom um, and therefore the, the risk is increasing. So we basically need to work on how to facilitate continuing to use social media in the classroom and to communicate with students, but in a way that is um, much lower risk for any uh, copyright claims. Um, I'm just gonna skip over these slides, but you can download them at the end if you want more information, but I'm just thinking I wanna leave time for uh, some questions. Um, so, as I said, we do have some copyright exceptions, but really you need uh, a license or um, it's also about knowledge because when you, for example, when we're saying about the videos, nobody knew that was the main problem is they're like, I don't understand like, what is copyright and what I can do and what I can't do. Um, so, and essentially a lot of the answers that they get is, well, you can't do that, you can't share this, you can't uh, share, um, but there are things you can do, you can use, um, public domain material that's already uh, that is not restricted by copyright um, and um, yeah sorry I'm just <laughs> reading the slide making sure because I'm flicking through without 
talking at the same time as the slide. So uh, what I think we need to do in this area, if I can get to the um, strategy, here we go, is uh, we need to definitely educate lecturers and university staff about copyright and their use of copyright material outside of the classroom on social media. Um, and then that's kind of like a short term goal. We also need to update our university uh, copyright policies because um, that would help keep the um, to help to protect the uh, lecturers or academics in what, and help them to be sort of understanding what they can and can't do. Uh, and maybe in the long term, we need to have a look at the copyright exceptions for education. So uh, just quickly, I mentioned that case um, about the bridge. There's an ongoing theme. And um, one of the things that came up is that they tried to argue that it was copyright exception for education, but obviously it failed because it was outside the rules of outside the walls of the classroom. It was on the website and therefore it was communication to the public. Uh, and that seemed a shame in, in the sense that it was it was originally used for a copyright exception per the end thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> many thanks Shaley, for this amazing presentation i would like to start with the with the q a um some of you have already wrote some questions um so below you see in the screen the q a icon so please feel free to type your questions and, and we will go through them. So I'm gonna start with the first one. Um, just saying, you know, I know this is probably too big of a topic for this webinar, but I will be interested in your view on the current case of Clearview versus Google et al. concerning the free use of images, that is the IP side of the case rather than the possible surveillance issue. Uh, yeah, I do think that might be too uh, big a question for this. <laughs> Maybe we need to have another webinar. <laughs> yeah, we would definitely need to have uh, another another webinar to address that because there's so there's there's many, we would have to explain the whole uh, the whole case. Uh, so maybe I will uh, get back to you on that one. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe with the next one, uh, the strategy of posting on social media will be different is po if posting on a website. Okay, so that's a that's a great question. I can definitely answer quickly. Um, so as you can see from the case that I mentioned about the uh, the bridge, um, no, in the sense that it, it became available once it was on the on the website. I suppose in a, in a way, you might even argue that on a website is a little bit higher risk. I mean, it depends, there's so many factors. It depends on the photograph, it depends on the, on the website. Um, but if I'm thinking about it from the perspective of the examples I've seen of users being uh, sued for copyright infringement, it was done through a software that scans the internet and scans social media. So in that sense, it's the same because um, from that perspective, the social media platform is just another website. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess in a sense, there's more content on social media and so it that might be less likely to be picked up, but I don't think that's a good way of deciding. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> another question. Um, who posts on social media does not agree implicitly to someone else sharing of this content. Uh, one of the various functions of social media is sharing some more rights. What do you think about this? Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, um, the, the question is, if you are posting on social media are not automatically um, somehow agreeing to someone else sharing this content. All right. So, I mean, in terms of the terms and conditions of the platforms, no, you're not because you warrant that what you post is your own and that you won't share anything without a uh, permission or a license. So therefore all the users are subject to that terms and conditions. And so in principle, the answer is no. In practice, the answer is yes. So I think that's what I said when I was saying about in your strategy, be smart about what you share because you have to ultimately know that it probably will be, um, 
infringed like other people will also share it and there are of course times when you benefit from the sharing and you benefit from especially if something goes viral then there's huge benefit to that so you can't always say that somebody uh, sharing your content uh, without permission is is always a bad thing but I think that needs to be part of your IP and copyright strategy is no knowing what you share probably will be shared again. Um, there are things you can do, you can watermark, you can um, make sure you've got all the metadata there to, so that the photograph comes back to you. But at the same time, just as many um, software things can, you know, you can crop out the, <laughs> the watermark, you can remove it on Photoshop. So it, there's no, there is no way of stopping somebody from sharing your content on social media, but there are there are steps you can take. And also, if you don't want your content shared on on social media, then you just be vigilant about, for example, taking advantage of the, the notice and take down procedures. So you are checking and if someone is sharing it, you ask them to remove it. Mm -hmm. Here, here I have another comment that I would like to see your opinion. Um, here it says, for brands, it is increasingly common to get fake requests for copyright infringement, which in fact are just phishing, quite time consuming for social media managers. It's, what was the first bit? You sometimes get what? Yeah, for brands, it is increasingly common to get fake requests for oh. copyright infringement. Yeah, I know this is a huge problem, um, just as much as uh, the infringement and, you know, you want to be able to make it. Uh, Google talk a lot about this, where they have just as many uh, fake requests as they do real requests and there's it's really not much they can do about it. I think um, it's a very unfair uh, platform. It's, it's so difficult to manage. You take YouTube, for example, if the video is suspected infringement, it will be taken down and the copyright holder gets to decide what they do with it. If the user believes, for example, that they benefit from the parody exception and therefore that should be allowed to be up, they have to go back and they have one chance to communicate with the, uh, the rights holder and argue their point. But um, it's not a fair playing field. So it's very difficult for them to, to be able to um, know when it's a real claim or when it's not a real claim and when there's an abuse of the claim system some like google they do have some procedures in place like if somebody's you know putting in thousands of claims in one go then they will flag them um, and look into it so I, I totally agree it's a huge problem and if you're um dealing with this a lot i mean you maybe if it was me that what i would do is just maybe like keep a a uh, record of the legitimate like <laughs> places claims come from and then places where they're not but then at the same time you don't ignore something and then it turn out to be a real claim so I really do sympathize that actually is a huge problem and I'm not entirely sure what's really interesting is in the other types of IP like trademark patent and design law we have criminal sanctions for uh, abusive abuse of the claim system and for claims that aren't real, but in copyright, it doesn't exist. Uh, so that may be part of the problem is that there's no there's no risk to the person giving the fake claim, and maybe that's something that needs to change. Hmm. And do you, your considerations about infringement on social media apply equally to restricted or private groups? Let's say, for example, Facebook private groups. Yes, uh, sorry, so if that wasn't clear, um, it, if you're talking about from an educational perspective, like making a Facebook group for your students, technically, yes, it still uh, doesn't fall within the copyright exception for educational institution. I mean, we still, as an institution, you still have to license works that go on the internal, like intranet and the, we use, say, Blackboard, you know, like the common um, online system for the students to access information, that work Go, that work that you put on there if you put a chapter of a book or something that's actually licensed um but it's kind of what happens in the background so maybe you don't know about it um i would say that in terms of uh, if you're not talking about education if you're just talking about in general a closed group it is still technically copyright infringement but uh, you know in theory the risk is lower because it's a closed group as far as i know i don't know if the software where you put the photograph in and it scans the internet I would assume they probably do have access even to, to private <laughs> uh, if you're thinking about Facebook. Um, they might even, you know, uh, that would be the policy of the platform, whether they would allow uh, for that kind of third party scanning or crawling of their of, uh, private groups. So I, 
I guess the answer is yes, it does apply. Perhaps the risk is lower, but we can't really be sure. Mm -hmm. And the next question I have here, um, it says that before the European directive on copyright in the digital single market went into effect, there was a general concern about the regulation fundamentally changing social media, making it harder to legitimately use copyright material. In your opinion, has that actually been happening or it has been just a misconception about the effects of the directive? Um, sorry, you mean, so the new directive that has just been uh, passed, but it's not actually been implemented yet. So we can't really say what the effects uh, will be. Uh, and in the UK, they're saying they might not even implement it at all. Uh, probably what they'll do is implement something very similar, but let's not call it the implementing the directive. But we have to see how each um, each country sort of implements it in their own in their own way. One thing I do think about the directive is that it does put the social media platforms at a high, holds them to a higher standard. Um, Potentially, though, everything's about how it's interpreted and how it's applied, because with the where it says best efforts, um, whether something like their notice and takedown procedure on YouTube, for example, whether that equates to the best efforts. Um, if it does, then nothing changes for them. Uh, but then perhaps for other platforms like Instagram, who they do have technically they have a notice and takedown system, but it's maybe not so uh available uh or user friendly as the one on youtube it was really the incentive for that clause anyway so they were trying to capture and put more pressure on youtube um and whether that works or not i actually well, my personal opinion is that hmm. i am ready to be proved wrong let's see hmm. um what what is it okay if to put pictures of people taking in public into public website, for example, people in the street or audience in a concert, what counts as public and what counts as private? That's a very interesting question. And it first depends on what country you're in when you take the photo. Uh, so as I mentioned, co copyright is territorial and the exceptions and rules for uh, that kind of thing are different in each country. Um, the photograph is, to, is to, from a copyright perspective, the photograph is owned by the photographer. So if you take the picture in the public space, you own the photo. What you might have is um, image rights issues and privacy rights issues. So for example, if you go to a concert and you stand in the front line, you're likely to be asked to sign a waiver um, because you might be in the in the video of, of the performer or something like that. So that's them covering their back, making sure that you don't bring a, a claim for, as I mentioned, privacy, image rights, or even performer rights, because you're technically the performer in the photo or the video, uh, moral rights as well. But um, from a copyright perspective, it is the photographer who owns the image of the person who's in the photo. Um, but again, it, it, that, it depends on, on the jurisdiction. Great. So unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all the questions. They have over 10 questions to, to go through it. Um, I'm just going to go to maybe the last one. Um, so do you think that Gigi Hadid will have a better chance in her claim for joint authorship following Cohen versus Martin, assuming English law applied? Well, I think that her argument about co-authorship is so interesting and uh, I personally found it very compelling, although m many people on the other side just laughed it off uh, and said it was absolutely ridiculous. But actually, I do think it has some standing because um, when she, uh, for, if you think about it, so she posed for the photo, for those who, who don't know the case, uh, she posed for the photo and that added value to the photo in the sense that if you imagine she walked and she turned away and hid her, her face from the camera and didn't kind of cooperate in the image, then the image would not have been of the same value. So not only did she like not turn away, she actually posed and her argument was she posed and she smiled and she, that's, you know, her, that's her talent. She's a model. Um, and I do think that that is um, a really 
I personally think that's a compelling argument. Um, I don't know how, the problem is it's a policy thing as well, because how would that work in practice? Um, I also think that that would, um, cha that would change the whole dynamics of, of Pat Brown. Mm -hmm celebrity uh, which is a whole nother game in the US like it's a whole kind of culture different culture than it is say here in the UK um, so it would have such a huge impact on so you know what do they do then they have to license the work from the from the celebrity in order to get it to, to sell it to the newspaper I mean it's got huge practical impacts that mean that it they would probably be reluctant to do it even if <laughs> in an academic perspective it it has you know has weight hmm. So for everyone, as mentioned before, the presentation will be made available on 4IP Council website after this webinar. And also please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter to receive updates on relevant academic studies, future webinars and case law summaries. Maybe Hayley, we can manage to convince you to do another one since this yeah. was yeah. <laughs> and I see so many questions that we haven't answered yet. So yeah. So, the so, question and answer, please, if you wanted to ask me directly, then feel free to get in touch. Amazing. Thanks so much for, for your ability. And uh, let's keep the dialogue. It's been extremely interesting. And thanks a lot for everyone joining and for you in particular, Haley, for sharing with you, with all of us, uh, all this knowledge. Thank you. And have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.